Hello, I'm Scott Turner, professor of biology at the State University of New York in Syracuse. I was meant to be here in person, but a bureaucratic problem back home has left me without a passport during the time I would otherwise be here. So Philippe and Frederick have kindly allowed me to offer a few comments by video. My contribution to this volume was chapter 10, titled Superorganisms and Superindividuality, the Emergence of Individuality in a Social Insect Assemblage. As you might gather from the title, I study social insects, specifically these creatures. This is a mound built by a widespread genus of mound-building termites, Macrotermes. This photograph was taken on my study site in Namibia. For lots of reasons, we have often equated the organism and the individual. What I argue in my contribution is that the equivalence may not be as tight as we usually imagine it to be. As is true for so many other things in biology, it is social insects like these that turn our conventional perceptions of the living world topsy-turvy. For example, these colonies, which are assemblages of millions of individual organisms, are also, in many ways, organisms themselves. This is hardly a new idea. Going as far back as the end of the 18th century, biologists and philosophers have been making the claim that social insect colonies are, to use the modern term, superorganisms. The interesting question is this, can superorganisms themselves be individuals of a sort? super individuals, as it were? The answer to that question depends, of course, on what we define the organism to be. In our modern gene-centered world, we naturally gravitate toward a genetic definition, and in organisms like ourselves, the genetic definition is quite strong. We comprise a social assemblage of cells that are descendants of a single zygote. The coefficients of relationship between the members of this assemblage are as high as they possibly can be. The organism, and by implication the individual, is therefore explained largely by kin selection. Large numbers of cells organize into a cooperative assemblage and sacrifice their own reproduction and work together to ensure that a set of reproductively privileged proxies, the germ cells, can pass on copies of their genes in their stead. And, of course, we're all familiar with the kin selection argument in favor of the emergence of superorganisms like social insect colonies. Large numbers of organisms, the sterile workers, sacrifice their reproductive future to ensure that reproductively privileged proxies, the queens and drones, can reproduce and pass on copies of their genes in their stead. I argue that genetics and kin selection are actually poor guides to helping us understand both the evolutionary emergence of the organism and its supposed equivalence with individuality. For example, kin selection doesn't explain particularly well the remarkable evolutionary convergence of the social insects of the Hymenoptera, the bees, ants, and wasps, and the insects I work on, the termites. The kin selection waters are also muddied by the emerging realization that life in general is strongly symbiotic, which binds genetically disparate organisms into strong mutualist associations that we might call symbiotic organisms. This is certainly true for the termites I work on, and it's becoming ever more true every day for conventional organisms and individuals like ourselves. We, too, are symbiotic organisms, walking ecosystems that include not only the genetically identical descendants of the zygote, but a host of other microbial genomes on our skin, digestive, and reproductive systems. What I argue is that the organism and individuality are more productively explored in physiological, not genetic, terms. I tend not to like the distinction that is sometimes drawn between organisms and superorganisms. Rather, I prefer what I call the organism-like system. By this, I mean an assemblage of living systems that do the thermodynamic work of homeostasis. And this encompasses the actual living world a bit better, I think, because it now scarcely matters what the living systems are that comprise an organism-like system. They can be cells assembled into an organism, genetically related organisms assembled into a social group, 
genetically unrelated individuals that organize into a mutualism, or symbiotic organisms that assemble even into ecosystems. What distinguishes them all is the coordinated mobilization of matter and energy to power what I regard as the fundamental distinctive attribute of living systems, homeostasis. For reasons that I've argued in a book that I published a few years ago, homeostasis necessarily implies cognition. This leads to a rather radical conclusion. Rather than defining the organism and individual genetically, as has been conventionally the case, it may be more productive to define them cognitively. Individuality is therefore no longer defined by an arbitrary boundary of a skin or the nebulous concept of genetic affinity, but by the emergence of a cognitive awareness of being distinct from the environment. Conventional organisms like ourselves can feel this intuitively. We are individuals to the extent that we are cognitively aware of ourselves as individuals. One of the surprising things that has emerged from my studies on these mound-building termites is the degree to which this genetically diverse assemblage of termites, fungi, and microbes acts together as a cognitive system, and this makes them arguably the most individualistic of all the superorganisms. Thank you very much.